Hey y'all, it's Possum Breath, but you can call me PB for short. When I asked a little while back for questions for a Q&A, a lot of them were about my character creation process. I decided to save those questions and make a whole standalone video so I could go into more detail. Please note, this video isn't a set in stone guide. This is the process that works for me, but every story is different and everyone's creative journey goes on its own path. This is meant to help inspire you and give you some extra tools to use as you find your own artistic voice, not to make you feel bad if you don't do things exactly the same way I do. As you'll see when we get into it, I don't even follow the exact same set of steps every time. If even one part of this video is helpful, or at the very least interesting to you, then I've done my job. I'm also going to be very thorough. This is the kind of thing I personally find fascinating, so I'm going to try and really get into the nitty gritty of my character creation process. That means this video is going to be pretty long, because there's a lot I do before I even think about drawing. Enough that we won't even get to the art part of things until part two. I've split things this way because I want the art video to also include general art knowledge and tips and tricks, so it's going to be plenty beefy on its own. This video will include spoilers for the plot I'm working on for these cats, so if you want the tasty lore, you're going to get it. When I come up with a character, the very first thing that matters is what role they're meant to play in the story. Some characters will obviously have more important roles to play than others, but every character in a story should be there for a reason, even if it's a small one. When coming up with a character, your first question should be why. Why are they here? Why are they important? Why can no existing character do the thing you want this character to do? This keeps your story tight and your cast easy to manage, and results in more interesting characters because all of them will have a clear purpose, rather than just being there to fill out the background. Cough cough errands. I found the question of why is always easier to answer when I have some kind of core idea to direct me as I create the story and its characters. I think of it like building blocks or Legos. No matter what, you need a strong foundation or the whole thing falls apart. It can be a central theme, a central conflict, a central character or relationship. It depends on the kind of story you want to tell. Get that foundation set in stone first. Then you can build out from it in whatever way you want, as long as everything ties back to that core idea. I like to do this for stories as a whole, as well as for groups and characters within the story. You've seen me do this with my cat clans, where they all have a central theme they embody in some way. Even singular characters get a foundational idea that I build up from as I flesh them out and this keeps the story feeling united at every level. You also need to keep in mind how all the parts go together, and be careful not to overload or unbalance the structure. You will start to see places where you need to add more support, and that's where a new character or plotline is necessary. It isn't a perfectly linear process. Sometimes I come up with an idea for a group of characters before the individuals, or a single character before I know what story I want to tell with them. You can start wherever you want, as long as you have a strong core concept to work from. If you start with a single character, look at that character's core idea and ask yourself what kind of story would best showcase it. If you start with a group of characters, you could ask yourself how each individual in that group uniquely embodies the group concept, and how that might lead to conflict either within the group or from outside forces. Because of the nature of the Clan Generator Challenge, I've had a set amount of roles to fill, and that has dictated a lot of the story. Bush Clan gave me a very small clan with mostly female cats and only one apprentice, which is not normal for a warrior cat's clan. My first thought was that something bad must have happened to put them in that position, so I started with a group of characters whose core idea was overcoming adversity, and I made sure to design every character in Bush Clan to embody that idea in some way. The foundational plot to support that idea was obvious. It centers on Bush Clan's journey toward overcoming their struggles, both personally and as a clan. Immediately, this necessitated additional support for the structure. If Bush Clan has struggles to overcome, what are those struggles, and where are they coming from? All three of the other clans were shaped around Bush Clan and their reaction to Bush Clan's situation. Sage Clan, as the largest clan, was the obvious choice for the most overt antagonist. A much larger clan would likely push for more territory, and so I decided they would be pushing against Bush Clan's borders and take the role of the most immediate threat. For Bay Clan, I wanted a clan that would fundamentally not understand the struggle that Bush Clan was experiencing, to be an emotional counterpoint to them. Miss Clan, meanwhile, understands Bush Clan is struggling, but has a policy of not getting involved in clan politics unless asked. I wanted all three to have different takes on the situation that would tie them back to the main plot and also highlight their personality as a clan. So even though the characters were handed to me on a sheet, 
This challenge honestly hasn't been too different from my normal process. If anything, it did a lot of the groundwork for me, because having a set number of casts to design dictated the plot where I might have otherwise had to struggle to find it. In essence, I was given a Lego kit instead of having to dig through the random pile of Legos myself. However, a Lego kit still only provides so many pieces. For instance, I needed to explain how Bayclan could have so many kits and apprentices while also having so few toms. Honeywhisker and Poppyfoot both needed fathers for their children, so I created Rascal the Loner and Benji the Barn Cat to explain where those kittens came from. Their existence also solidified Bayclan's close relationship with the non-clan cats. Rather than simply saying that Bayclan is friendly to outsiders, we have concrete named examples with direct ties to cats in the clan. Their why, in terms of their importance to the narrative, is clearly defined. And that brings us back to our work today, filling in some other gaps. I mentioned that the Bush Clan is being threatened on all sides. A group of rogues has recently been pushing up against the back of their territory. They exist to truly give Bush Clan a sense of being cornered, so that it will be that much more satisfying when they triumph. And they also exist to fill one other very important role. I said that Swanstone would be the first to suggest a real solution to Bush Clan's problem, and in true Bay Clan fashion, her suggestion is this. Bush Clan, instead of driving off the rogues, should recruit them. Then not only do they not have to worry about loss of territory, but their population will no longer be so small. They'll have more toms, and more toms means more kittens. Pebble Star is going to ultimately decide this is the best option she has, and go forward with it. On a logical level it makes sense, and on a thematic level it's an example of Bush Clan overcoming a struggle by turning it into a strength. One of the major plot threads is going to be about Bush Clan trying to negotiate with the rogues, and then the rogues adjusting to clan life. This means in terms of character, I need characters that will fill gaps in Bush Clan's structure as a group, and that will have interesting interactions with the cats that are already there. So we know we're going to be making some rogues. We know their basic why, as a group but not as individuals, and now we need to start fleshing them out and giving them their own personal whys. A lot of the time, I'll start with a name. A name is a great starting point for me because it gives me an immediate impression of what the character is like, which I can then build around. Drawing on my own associations with the name, I can start to pull together ideas to build a foundation for the character. In the case of this challenge, I was given many of the names instead of having to come up with them, and so characters formed around them. A great example is Chantrell Star. I already knew she was the leader of the clan that plays the role of main antagonist. There are a lot of different ways to make a character who fits that story role, but seeing a super long and somewhat fancy sounding name immediately put me in mind of a high and mighty queen, and so that became her core idea. I decided that she would be regal, superior, and domineering. As you add traits, try and find concrete ways to showcase them. For Chantrell Star, I could just say she has a feeling of superiority, but that doesn't tell us much about her as an individual. Instead, I decided to express that specifically by giving her a focus on bloodline, because bloodline is very important to royalty. This ties back into her core concept and tells us more about why she feels superior. Her bloodline traces back to true lions, which are essentially warrior cat royalty. For characters whose names I'm not handed by RNG, I often will go with the first thing that pops into my head that has the right vibe. I can change it later if needed. Though I've found that often names that are supposed to be placeholders wind up sticking because I get fond of them. Be careful what you use for a placeholder because it might accidentally make it into the final draft. To go back to our Bay Clan examples, Rascal was easy. His name is also the core concept of his character. This guy is a rascal. He's a troublemaker but ultimately harmless, and likes wandering around too much to settle in a clan. We know Honey Whisker is sweet and kind and has a good sense of when things are off, so we can deduce that Rascal must be a good guy if she stayed with him. Benji, meanwhile, is clingy. We know this from my description of Poppyfoot. He's well-meaning, but somewhat over-eager to please. Benji's core concept is that he is a cat who defines himself by his relationship to other cats, and I chose a name that, for lack of a better descriptor, sounded to me like a name a just a little guy would have. As you build your structure, you will naturally find more areas in your story that need support. As you create characters, you will create plot, and as you create plot, you will create plot holes to fill. I've established that Benji is clingy. He definitely loves Poppyfoot, so why hasn't he joined her in Bay Clan, given that Bay Clan has nothing against welcoming in outsiders? Benji's core concept is defining himself by his close relationships, so what would be most likely to impact his decision would be another close relationship keeping him in the barn. Where there's one barn cat, there's usually more, so I'm going to give him a sister named Latte who has young kittens of her own. He loves Poppyfoot, but also doesn't want to leave his sister, giving him his own internal conflict. 
Even if that internal conflict never plays a major role in the story, it will inform Benji's character and thus his actions, making him feel more well-rounded. We have refined Benji's why, both in terms of his in-character motivation and his out-of-character usefulness to the story. Latte herself I likely won't design. She is very incidental to the plot and mainly exists to enrich Benji's motivation, but if I need to fill a plot role later that she'd be suited for, that can always change. So, with all this theory in mind, we can put it into practice and start designing our rogues. First, we need to know how many cats we're going to be designing in the first place. To build the rogue group, I started with roles that made logical sense. The group must have a leader, and would probably have a cat who has some healing experience. They probably have a couple of cats who are mainly hunters, and they'd also likely have cats who came along because of their relationship to another cat in the group. I added a sister for the leader and a mate for one of the hunters. And finally, I put in a former kitty pet who is still very unused to outdoor life. If a major part of these cats' story is adjustment to clan life, then it makes narrative sense to have at least one character for whom it will be a big adjustment. When that cat is considered on par with the rest of the warriors, that's how you'll know the rogues have fully integrated into Bush Clan. In this way, every rogue has a reason to be in the story. When starting on the leader, I started with the most important why in terms of plot. These rogues will eventually join Bush Clan. There has to be a reason why the leader of the rogues would agree to do so, or the entire story doesn't happen. I've decided he has already been secretly seeing Golden Sight, and his affection for her is part of why he agrees to join. This is a good example of an already existing character working well to fill a new role. It gives Golden Sight her own unique story and more impact on the plot overall. Her role previously boiled down to Campy and Pa's mentor, which wasn't nothing, but didn't give her a lot to do. Also, I think it will be very funny when the other cats find out that cautious, purposeful, quiet Golden Sight has been sneaking off to see a rogue. It's always the one you least suspect. In terms of the rogue leader, having him join Bush Clan at least partly for love also makes him more sympathetic and likable. He isn't doing this as some calculated political move. His why is wholesome. This is important, because the rogues all need to be at least somewhat likable since they're going to eventually be part of our protagonist group. For his name, I chose Milo, because the name Milo makes me think of someone who is caring, quiet, and a little tired. He's trying his best to take care of this group of cats who depend on him, and he's always worried he's not doing well enough. His core concept is basically tired dad. In this way, he's also a good mirror to Pebble Star. The two of them will be able to understand each other's struggles, and will be able to find common ground that way, making negotiation with the rogues easier. Next is the rogue's healer. It would make sense that a group of lone cats would have at least one cat who was decent at healing. This gave me the golden opportunity to address Bush Clan's other issue, their lack of a doctor. The neatest possible solution is for one of their recruited rogues to take over that job, and it would also be another reason for Bush Clan to really work hard to get them to join. Because he'll be working closely with Cindertail, I wanted a cat who would balance him out and help advance his character development. My first thought for that was a confident, outgoing cat who could help him regain his own confidence. Essentially, his core concept was the opposite of Cindertail. Cindertail is a worrywart. This cat rarely worries about anything. I named him Gemini to convey his extroverted, knowledgeable, and slightly mischievous personality. Because of this name, I also decided that he'd be a chimera cat, a mix of long hair and short hair. Instead of having the classic split face look associated incorrectly with chimeras, his two faces show in his personality. Normally, he is easygoing and fun-loving, but when he's in the healing den, he puts on his other face and becomes serious and focused. You see how the name can be a jumping-off point to inform the character. Scout is Milo's sister and the clan's main hunter. I like to think the group was originally just Milo and Scout. Possibly they were abandoned as kittens or the children of rogues who lost their parents and had to survive on their own. Because Milo is a gentle and thoughtful cat, I decided that Scout would be the more pragmatic and outgoing of the two. Scout's name is also a word that is a job, and it's her job as well as her core concept. She is the lookout, the guard, and the protector. She's the one who worries about Milo while Milo worries about everyone else, and her fighting and hunting skills were developed because she grew up feeling like she had to protect him. The cat already in the clan I thought she might have an interesting interaction with is Gorseblaze, who will definitely be the cat the most against allowing rogues to join. Gorseblaze, out of all the cats, is the most attached to doing things the right way, and I think she and Scout will initially butt heads and may even fight. Gorseblaze recognizing Scout's skill and accepting her as a valuable member of the clan will be another sign in the narrative that the rogues are officially part of Bush Clan. Tucker is the clan's other hunter. Tucker is admittedly the patrol guy of this group. He's the cat that keeps things going and is there to support everyone else. 
His name, Tucker, is the kind of name you'd give just some guy. And that's also his core concept. I decided that would actually make him an interesting counterpoint to Campion Paw. Campion Paw is the only non-elder Tom in Bush Clan before the rogues arrive, and he's nervous about having all that weight on his shoulders. I want Tucker to become something of an uncle figure to him, never replacing his deceased father, but providing him an adult Tom role model that he currently lacks. Pepperstep could fill that role, but Pepperstep is busy with his own family drama, and frankly, I think Campion Paw would be too nervous to try and go to the former leader for personal advice. Tucker will also be dealing with feeling like he has a lot to learn and live up to. He and Campion Paw will have the same feelings of awkwardness and insecurity about their place in the clan, allowing them to form a friendship that may help both of them feel more at ease. Bristol is Tucker's mate. I decided that Bristol would be a good counterpoint to Smokeheart, and so Bristol will be joining the clan expecting kittens. This gives Bush Clan a reason to want to recruit her, and it gives Smokeheart someone to share the nursery with. In the area I grew up, there was a high-end grocery store called Bristol Farms, and I named her Bristol because to me it made her sound a little haughty. Bristol is standoffish and guarded, and is very concerned for the safety of her kittens above everything else. Her core concept is protective mother. She's found life as a rogue difficult, and is mainly staying for Tucker and because she knows she's safer in a group than she would be alone. She is always on edge, and that makes her snappy and distrustful, but that isn't who she is deep down. Ultimately, she will agree to join the clan specifically for her kitten's sake. I want her and Smokeheart to eventually bond over their love of their mates and kittens, realizing they both ultimately want the same thing and forming a close friendship and mutual respect. Seeing her kittens safe and healthy with a more secure future will be the thing that gets Bristol to really start to relax into clan life. Finally, we have the ex-kitty pet Socks. I wanted him to be the picture of kitty pet life, so he gets a very straightforward kitty pet name. This, again, is to highlight the subplot of the rogues adjusting to clan life. He's less meant to contrast with a specific character so much as he's meant to contrast with the entire clan. Think of Socks a little bit like Rusty in the earliest Warriors books. He is the cat who knows nothing about clan life, who needs to have everything explained to him, and who is eager and excited to learn even if he isn't very good at the start. I want him to start out as soft and unskilled as possible, so that when he becomes a full warrior it will really show you how far he and the rest of the rogues have come in terms of becoming proper members of the clan. Despite not having a visual design for him yet, I can tell you the one I draw will have to include a collar. The clearest visual mark of not a warrior. I'm also going to make him one of the most stereotypical cats in terms of design. He's going to be a silly tuxedo boy. I want him to look like a cat you could see in your neighbor's window if you walked outside right now, and that is his core concept. The most stereotypical kitty pet possible. And that's where we'll leave it for today. You can see we already have the solid beginnings of a defined group of characters. Next time we'll talk about how to take that idea of a character and translate it into a visual design, as well as some general art know-how that I've found useful in my time as an artist. If you haven't yet, consider giving this video a like and a comment to let me know what you thought, and subscribe so you can catch part two when it comes out. Thank you very much, and see you next time. When starting on the leader, I started with the most important why in terms of the plot. Ollie. Yeah? When starting on the leader, I start- Oliver. That's my chair. Dingus. Come here. Yeah? Come here. Oh! Yeah! Ollie. Goodness gracious.